So what I'm here to talk about today is the notion of an indie open source. And I'll talk about more about what that means in a bit. Um, for me, the big headline here, don't die, is sort of my mantra for life. Um, when I do open source, well, yeah, it's kind of by definition my mantra for life. But uh, my mantra for both running projects um, and my company is, if, at all, if, if everything else fails, try not to die. And then you can always try again if you die. Can't try again. So I'm going to start with a story. Um, I was working on Rails 3 for a long time, for 18 months or so. And somewhere around the 12-month mark, uh, DHH in Campfire chat room uh, pinged me. And he said, in public, in front of everybody, uh, so hey, Yehuda, what apps are you working on right now? And I got really angry at him. I said, I'm not working on any apps. I'm working full time on Rails. How do you expect me to have time to work on anything? Um, except for working full-time on Rails. And he said, no, listen to me. You need to be working on apps or you're not going to be grounded. Um, he gave me a speech. And I got really angry. And I think I probably spent like two or three months being really angry at him. Um, but actually, I think he was right. And I'll, I'll go into more as I go. But I think the idea that people who are working on open source projects should work on real things that they, that they care about, not just real things, not like toys, not like to do MVC, but something real that they care about every day, I think that that's really uh, valuable. I've actually done it both ways. I've done the Rails 3 thing, where I was 18 months in with, have, with not having done any real work. And I've done, done it the way I do it now, which is very little time for Ember. And actually, my total productivity, which I measure in terms of shipping features that help real users, is much higher with 20% time than it ever was at the end of my 18 months of Rails. So keep that in mind. Now, I come to think of open source projects as and their ecosystems, like organisms. Uh, they're constantly under attack by pathogens, both internal and external pathogens. And our goal with open source projects is to build up an immune response to those attacks. And I think the best thing, the most important thing that you can do to build up that immune system is to diversify your project. It's a, kind of a weird trick, one weird trick, but it has a lot of really positive effects. And when I say diversification, I mean a lot of different things. Um, so one thing that I mean, and this is something that I've talked about a lot to individual people, is if this is the Ember Core team here. I know I'm not supposed to point. Uh, this is the Ember Core team here. And you can see here that there's three people here that I'm calling out. Uh, Track, who works on documentation, Leia, who works on our events and logistics, and Robert Jackson, who works on infrastructure. All three of them are full-fledged members of the core team. And they work on things whose implementation details the rest of the core team does not want to have to think about. And just like I don't want Robert Jackson, or sorry, I don't want Leia or Trek or Robert coming and saying, let me look at this very detailed line of code that you're in the middle of working on, and I need you to explain to me exactly what's going on. I think Leia doesn't want me going over to her and saying, please put the signage for, the, for EmberConf next to the bathroom over here. Right? These are implementation details that people who are very good at what, they're, what they do are, are good at. And I think we should, we should let people uh, be on the core team and have, uh, have their sort of we should let people be on the core team um, and do their work as if they were uh, sort of core contributors on other projects. So on other projects, core contributors are code. They write code. And if you're doing events or if you're doing infrastructure, you're sort of second class. And I think we should, we should not do that. Um, and then another way of thinking about diversity is diversity of what companies you're part of. And this is maybe uh, also very important. So here's a bunch of people from Tilda, the company I work at. There's uh, somebody from Groupon, Trek. Uh, there's independent guy. There's a couple people from the company Yap. There's a person working on Express Checkout and a person working on Dockyard. And I think this is actually really powerful. I think the idea that you have a lot of people from a lot of different companies sharing responsibility for the project that you're working on forces you to actually think about what you're doing as a project and not have it be sort of this myopic view of the world. And at Tilda, we sort of think about this, um, with our open source work as sort of a trifecta. We, number one, have our own app. Like I said before, having your own app is the most effective way of all to make sure you're doing things correctly. Um, number two, we train. And by training, we understand how beginners are feeling about things. And number three, we consult, both on new greenfield projects and also projects that are starting to fail. And we get a really good idea of what's going on 
um, with our open source. And I think that ends up being really powerful. So I think even if you think as a person working on open source, like I think I'll be way more productive as a full-time open source person cranking out features day in and day out, I think you actually end up being a lot more effective both as an individual and as an open source project by being very, uh, by diversifying how you think about things and spending maybe more time understanding and learning and collecting experiences than trying to crank out features without really under, without thinking about what the goals are. Now, the most effective projects I've ever seen in my career and the most effective projects I've worked on are what I'm calling indie open source. And what I mean by that is a project that's driven and directed by a large group of companies, individuals, and interests. There's a paradox that I've noticed in open source, which is that companies with multiple full-time employees don't actually seem any quicker, and they sometimes move slower than indie open source projects. And I've thought a lot about why this is the case. And my answer to this paradox, and my key point about indie open source, is that shoveling money at an open source project can actually have the opposite of the intended effect. I think money and isolated full-time employment causes people to become hubristic and slip into big upfront design and the idea of big rewrites and revolution all the time. And we have to break everything in order to get, make any progress as opposed to evolutionary steps. And now that you have a, a diverse team, you have a, a group of people working on stuff, I think it's important that the core team maintain its focus on the medium term. Um, notice I didn't say long term. I don't think that focusing a lot on the very long term is very effective. Things change too fast. But I think you want to focus on the medium term vision for the project. And I, I think perhaps uh, more importantly, it's important that the core team get the community on board. Make sure that the community actually understands what the vision for the project is so people don't spend a lot of time going off in a direction that is contrary to what you're planning on doing. Maybe they can go work on a different project that may more aligns with their interests. And I think often uh, people get get uh, feckless. They don't want to say, our project is about X. And so you have a lot of people spending a lot of time uh, doing, uh, spending a lot of time and energy doing things that don't end up really aligning. So going out there and saying, here's what our project is, here's what it's about, I think that's the job of the core team. And I think this role actually benefits significantly from diversifying. Because if you have a small, a group of people that work at a single company that are working full time, it's very easy for them to get together in a room and come up with a direction that sounds good to them but then when you go out there and talk to the community, maybe it doesn't match up, and you don't really have a good way of figuring out how that that's happening, because you, you, know, you get groupthink. So having a diverse group of people means that you, you know, sit in a room, and when everyone's talking about what the direction is, everybody can come up with something that, is, that represents a large, broad array of interests. And sort of similar to this, a lot of people sometimes ask me, so what do you think about BDFLs? Is it important to have a BDFL? Is it important to have a core team? Maybe the project should be run more like a democracy. Maybe that's better. And I sort, the way I sort of think about it is that all these things are sort of interesting tactical questions, but more interesting is who has legitimacy? And I think when a project is running well, whether or not the project has an official BDFL or not, there is some person on the project that has the most moral authority. So uh, I think in JavaScript, Brendan Eich has a lot of moral authority. Um, I have a lot of moral authority on Ember. DHH has a lot of moral authority on Rails. And it doesn't really matter if we're called BDFLs or not. What matters is that the rest of the team looks up to you and says, we're kind of at a deadlock. What, what should we do here? And if you lay out a vision, you say, here's what I think we should do in the next version of our product, that you will, that you will have legitimacy. And the, similarly, the core team itself has to have legitimacy. Um, I personally like core teams to contain the most active contributors, not just code contributors, but people working with beginners, people doing docs and training, a big group of people. And I find that. By having your core team have a big group of people, you can effectively avoid missing uh, things that affect a large group of users that just somehow doesn't make it into the discussions that you're having. And I think it really helps to, make, to have the community uh, have legitimacy for the core team. So again, whether or not it's called a core team or whether it's not it's called a BDFL, legitimacy is the key point. And actually, probably more, more time that I spend in the Ember core team room or the Rails core team, there's more time spent in those rooms around strengthening people's resolve. Because honestly, the internet is a, a really crappy place. Uh, people spend a lot of time yelling at you, throwing things at you, writing blog posts about you. And they might think it's no big deal. They may think one tweet is no big deal. But sometimes it really, it really gets to people. So I think uh, the BDFLs in particular, but also the core team, their job is to strengthen everyone's resolve, to say, we're all, we're all in this together. Let's move forward. Let's actually do things. Uh, in a particular way. Let's not worry too much about the haters. And honestly, uh, probably half the time I spend talking with Tom, one, of the other, one or the other of us is giving each other a pep talk. 
about, you know, don't worry too much about this thing someone said or that thing somebody said. It's fine. We're, we're doing fine. You know, we have users. People are adopting us. So diversifying your project, having legitimacy, these are all good things. But I think what they do is they offer you protection against some of these pathogens that I was talking about. They protect you from making really big mistakes. And again, I think a common theme in a lot of the mistakes that people tend to make is hubris. There's a lot of different kinds of hubris. One kind of hubris that I see a lot is, is the Big Bang hubris, the second systems effect. And what I mean by this is when you work on a successful project, and, it, and this becomes worse if you have an insular core team that's working on something full time, it's very easy to say, you know, we built this thing, it's awesome, it has some adoption, but oh my god, this is so terribly implemented. If only we could just start over. So many things have changed, so many of our assumptions are wrong. If only we could just start over, it's great. And you could convince yourself in a small group setting that this is totally fine. You can totally uh, convince yourself of that. But actually, I, and, and actually, I almost made this mistake during the Rails MERB merge. So after the merge, I was like, you know, we need to, we learned all this stuff in MERB which is a competitor to Rails, we merged in. I think what we really need to do is make these big sweeping changes. And the first thing DHH said was, we're gonna make every decision on the basis of technical virtue, but backwards compatibility matters. People need to be able to upgrade their apps. And he said in his post, there are no big, this is not a big bang rewrite. And that was actually really meaningful to me. That's something that stuck with me um, since then. And actually, at, in this last meeting, um, I came to the Ember Core meeting with essentially the plan for Ember 2.0. Uh, we've been working on for two, two to four months-ish. And there were some things that were really aggressive. Like I said, we're going to get rid of controllers, and we're going to give you a plug-in for a subset. And Robert Jackson basically wouldn't let me leave the room until we said, no, we're going to actually support the full thing. We're going to support uh, a plug-in that supports the, the, what we have today. And I think that's something that you can easily, if I was a strong figure and we were all together working full-time, maybe I could have bullied Robert into saying, no, we'll just, you know, people have to take their bumps, it's 2.0, it's a big breaking change. But I think having a group of people that are all working on real apps, that are all in a bunch of different places, really protects you from this problem. Now, here's, a, here's something that I've seen uh, online. And usually when I see it, what people are saying is, you have this guy, he came up with this great idea. It's a bunch of round wheels. You have these guys, they're driving, these cavemen. They're saying, we're too busy. What a bunch of idiots. These cavemen should just stop what they're doing, slap on those wheels, and boom, everything is great. But the reality is, I look at this, and I see sort of the opposite. I say, those guys with the round wheels, they're doing a bad job at adoption, right? They're doing a bad job explaining to the square wheel guys why they should stop. They're not helping the square wheels guys keep pushing. They're getting, those square wheels guys, they're getting some shit done, right? And the round wheel guys are saying, hey, I, let me t I have presented to you an idea. Here are some round wheels. If you stop what you're doing right now and put on the round wheels, you'll get some benefit. So take the day off, put on the round wheels. I promise you, you'll get 20% improvement, 30% improvement. And I think this is something that we think in open source that we can get away with. But I think the reality is that people have a job to do. I have a job to do. Every day I work on code. And I don't have the luxury of stopping everything and putting on the round wheels, no matter how much better they may be. We have to figure out how to do it incrementally. So incrementally is really how it has to work. And I think some people say, well, incremental sounds slow. It sounds like you're getting to the local maximum. And I think the funny thing about incrementalism is a lot of times people say, you know, the web is moving so fast. Every six months, there's all these new features. How could you possibly keep up with it if you just go incrementally? How could you possibly keep up with it if all you ever do is make little changes here and there? And the funny thing is that the web itself has the most epic compatibility constraints of any platform. And the web, you can't break the web for anything. And somehow, Chrome, Firefox, even Internet Explorer now, they have all managed to make progress without stagnating the platform. In fact, they're the thing we're looking up for as evidence that we need to break everything all the time. So, and I think what Chrome, and Fire, Chrome first and then Firefox figured out was there's a solution to the problem. And the solution to the problem is called release channels. And Ember basically just copied that. So in Ember, we have a master branch. You know, we ship a bunch of stuff. Every week, we ship a new uh, beta release. Every six weeks, we release a new release version. We are very strict about Semver. After 1.7, you know, we, we go again. We have the 1.7 beta, and we go again. And it works exactly the same as Chrome. So if what you're trying to do is keep up with Chrome, no problem. We have, an, we have a process that's exactly the same as Chrome. 
right? We do exactly the same process with the exact same intent, which is stability without stagnation. And really what this is about is always be shipping, right? If you ship all the time, then you can fail fast. You can discover your mistakes quickly. You can evolve the community one piece at a time. You can, uh, with Semver, you can make sure that people feel confident upgrading every six weeks, right? You, you make sure you don't break things. If you break something, it's a bug. You go and fix it. You release a new release patch, right? And then the community is able to come along. So most Ember users are on either the latest version 1.8 or one version behind 1.7. And that means that we can actually move much faster, right? So it seems like, well, we're making these little incremental steps. How can we move fast? But the reality is that each, each of these incremental steps is something that the whole community moves forward on. And this is the same thing as the web, right? The same way that the web is able to move forward is by taking these little incremental steps. But we've learned through evergreen browsers that if you can get everyone to make these steps, you can make really fast progress measured in you know, months, not years or, or decades. And the more you ship, the easier it is to ship, right? So if you're shipping every six weeks, you have to get really good automation. You can't say, oh, well, it sucks. We can't ship. We, it's too hard. The hardest part, actually, is the initial leap of faith, the belief that you can do it incrementally. Um, actually, when we first shipped the six-week release, release cycle, we didn't have any automation. And we announced we're doing six-week re release cycles. And I remember going to the Ember Core chat room and saying, hey, guys, I guess we have six weeks to get the automation done. And we did it, and it's great. So Python 3. Um, I think it's not controversial anymore to say that Python 3 has gone too slowly. And I sort of look at, look at Python 3 as a question of how do we avoid this problem of bifurcated ecosystems in our projects? How do we do it successfully? And to me, the thing that went wrong with Python 3 was that it was impossible for a very long time to write one Python program that ran in both the 2x and 3x branch at the same time, which meant you couldn't really bridge the ecosystem. So I worked on Rails 3, and when I worked on Rails 3, we supported Ruby 1.8 and Ruby 1.9 at the same time. And what that meant fundamentally was that you could take a plugin, an authentication plugin or something, and you can make it work for both Ruby 1.8 and Ruby 1.9 and Rails 2.3 and Rails 3.0, right? And maybe it wasn't the easiest thing in the world, but you could do it. And I think that when you're writing open source projects and you're moving ecosystems, you always have to think not just about not making breaking changes regularly, which is important, but also if you're going to make breaking changes, what's the story for moving the ecosystem? How do you, how do you get your add-ons, your plugins, the third-party stuff that people use, how do you get them to be able to detect the changes and make plugins that work seamlessly? As the community moves, they're always supporting maybe the bridge, right? The ecosystem is the bridge. Now, you have to play the long game, I think, which sometimes means being early on tech if it brings value. Um, Ember bet on promises and JavaScript modules pretty early. We bet on Ember CLI, and it, it paid off. And I think sort of an interesting thing is that it's important to balance the long-term goals that you have. So things like ES6 modules and um, Ember CLI, these, are, these were big bets, and they were sort of long-term things. And we had to make a lot of shifts as we went. So when I say you have to play the long game, I mostly mean you kind of want to point the ship in a direction. You want to say modules would be an awesome world. Having build tools would be an awesome world. Let's get there. But you have to be willing to make changes along the way. You have to ship so frequently that you can detect quickly if, you've, if the pl place you're pointing the ship is in the wrong direction and keep making some course corrections. You need to pop back up periodically and repoint the ship. And I think, fundamentally, diversity and evolution Diversification of your core team, diversification of what you work on, what you think about, who you talk to, and evolving things slow at a time. That beats monoculture, having a small group of people working full time on things in the same place. And it beats rewrites any day of the week. And I think a lot of people look at this and they say, this feels like a paradox, right? This feels like a, a paradox. You have full time people, you have people in the same place. This is normally the stuff that productivity is made of. And I think in open source, it just doesn't turn out that way. It turns out that being able to have a big group of people having a healthy immune system with a lot of ideas um, is more effective. And I think you want to inoculate your project from these common mistakes that people make. You want to diversify your team right away. You want to divest decisions about the direction from a single corporation. You want to ship early and ship often so you can evolve nimbly and, res and respond to changes in the environment. And I think let's build robust communities in your own open source projects diversify ownership quickly, and choose evolution over rewrites. If you work at a company that runs an open source project, if you're on one of those teams, spend some serious time every week to work on applications and expand your core team to interested external people, even if they're not working full time. As a community, 
let's encourage corporate open source projects to divest control and avoid big bang rewrites. And if you're an application author, I ask that you strengthen our collective immune system by choosing high quality projects that are directed and built by a, gro a broad group of people and companies. Thank you very much. Yeah.